from uh, UK talk to us about visual abstracts. Uh, so Michelle is a nephrologist uh, currently uh, living and working in North Yorkshire in the UK. Uh, she uh, she was a nephrology social media intern in, in 2018, and we had just started making um, uh, visual abstracts at that time. And and Michelle just you know took it on like a fish to water, and she's really uh, expanded and built upon that. She's been on faculty now for since then, uh, teaching us, uh, teaching you know many of us uh, and our interns how to make visual abstracts. Uh, her work has been featured in many nephrology journals, uh, in a couple of nephrology textbooks. Uh, I'm sure some of you have those uh, books. And she's created a series of infographics, uh, which has been even published by the KDIGO uh, guidelines. Um, she's currently pursuing a master's degree in medical education, which fits in very well with today's uh, discussion on visual abstracts. Please go ahead, Michelle. OK, hi, everybody. Um... Thank you for inviting me. I'm swap for I'm giving you this talk. Um, I feel very strongly about this subject, you know. And thank you for giving up your time so early as well to come and um watch me talk about this. Um, so just a few disclosures. So as um swap mentioned, um, I used to be the course director for the graphical communications rotation, um, in the nephrology social media collective, um, and I also created a visual abstract course um for the Duke Clinical Research Training Program, and there's a QR code at the bottom of the screen um which you scan will take you to that to that course. So that course is, that course is totally free. Um, I'm really proud of it. Um, and I'll be showing this car um this code at the end of the talk as well. So um there'll be another chance to revisit it if you miss it this time round, and I also create um visual abstracts for a few journals. So I used to do it for kidney medicine and KI reports, um, but now I do uh, mostly uh, regular VAs for um, CJSON. So a bit of my, about my experience. So these are a few of um, the visual abstracts I've created. So I don't really keep a count on how many I've done so far, but if I were to make an educated guess, I think I've made maybe about 250 to 300 <laughs> visual abstracts. Um, and as part of the Nephrology Social Media Collective, I've also taught about 150 um, nephrologists and healthcare professionals on how to make visual abstracts. So I've done this quite a lot um, and I really enjoy it. Um, so a few more disclaimers. So I have not received any training in graphic design, so I can't draw to save my life. And clearly you don't need to know how to draw to create visual abstracts. And um, my word is of course not gospel. Um, I have got a lot of experience um, and hopefully some of what I say might be helpful to you and some of you might find your own way and that's totally fine as well. But hopefully you get a few more ideas um, after my talk. And um, I also created all the visual abstracts in this talk um, unless um, when stated otherwise. So here are some of my um, learning objectives for the talk. So after the talk, you should be hopefully be able to describe the key components of a visual abstract. Um, you hopefully will be a bit more aware of what the evidence says around the utility of visual abstracts. Um, you're able, you'll be able to appreciate how cognitive load theory can help you create effective visual abstracts. And we'll talk a bit more about cognitive load theory in, um, later on. And we'll talk a bit about the limitations of visual abstracts. And at the end of it, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, you'll feel inspired enough to start creating your own visual abstracts. So I thought um, it would be quite cool to start off the talk by giving you a brief timeline on how visual abstracts evolved. So in 2016, the first visual abstract was created by a surgeon in the States called Dr. Andrew Ibrahim. Um, and the first visual abstract was published in the Annals of Surgery. And since then, um, this visual abstract uh, movement has been adopted by a lot of journals and institutions. And you might see some very familiar logos over here. Sorry. <coughs> and people are um, continuously innovating and developing the movement. <clears throat> So some people are currently making live visual abstracts um, where you create visual abstracts um, live while at conferences, while people are presenting. And there are also people who are starting to make visual abstracts as well. So I say visual abstract a lot, but what are visual abstracts? So I think of visual abstracts as a graphical representation of um, a content of a journal. And I think of it as um, the graphical form of the text abstract. So we should think about this as a movie trailer of a study, you know, and certainly this is definitely not a substitute for reading the paper. And this comes out a lot in contention because people go like, oh, why are visual abstracts so great? Like, I think the visual abstract, as I said, is just an extension. It's a, it's a graphical form of the text abstract. And you wouldn't accept 
you wouldn't expect people to take um, the text abstract as a representation of the whole paper. So why would you expect visual abstracts to be the same, you know? But where visual abstracts are very helpful, you know, they have a lot of uses. For example, you can use it to show a brief um, summary of a study um, when you're talking about studies in journal clubs. Um, you can use um, visual abstracts in teaching. So, for example, before where you where you would summarize a study by using maybe one or two lines of text, you can now use a picture which will give um, a more well-rounded summary of a picture as well. And then you can use um, visual abstracts in other teaching methods like tutorials, for example. Um, I also get asked about, oh, so, okay, I understand that that is a visual abstract, but what about infographics? Are they the same thing? So technically, yes. So I think of infographics as a catch-all term. So for example, this is an infographic um, that I made for KDIGO, which showed um, a RAS blockade um, recommendations in people with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. So an infographic shows you information based on a single topic. So the, the knowledge that is contained within the infographic can come from multiple sources. And I think of visual abstracts as a subset of that. So for each visual abstract, you tend to just show the information based on one study. So for example, in contrast, um, this is a visual abstract showing um, study details from the Figaro DKD study. So that's how I think about infographics versus visual abstracts. And um, here are a few more examples of visual abstracts. So here is probably one of the, one of the earliest visual abstracts. Um, and this is based on a paper by Dr. Andrew Ibrahim who created the visual abstract. And then you can see how things have progressed over the years. So these are a few other different um, examples of visual abstracts published in different journals, created by different people, um, showing information on different studies. So why are visual abstracts appealing? In my perspective, I like visual abstracts because I find it a very efficient use of my time. So I look at, if I see a picture of a study, I see a visual abstract of a study, I can just glean the key points of a study very quickly compared to like reading the text abstract. So to demonstrate this, let's do an experiment. So what I'll do is I'll put up a picture um, of a text abstract of a paper with a 15 second timer. And then I'll let you read that text abstract. And then after that, I'll show you the visual abstract that I made for that text abstract with the same timer. And then we'll, and hopefully it will demonstrate my point. Yeah, so this is the text extract coming up. And that ticking is the timer. OK, so that was quite quick. And um, here is the visual abstract. Yeah, so hopefully that kind of illustrates my point as to um, how much easier it is to get the same amount of information from a, a visual abstract compared to a text abstract. Now, next, um, so we know that visual abstracts are mostly the same. They mostly show the same information. But here is what the here is what I think should, um, as a minimum, be present on visual abstracts. So I usually start the top of the visual abstract with what question the study is trying to answer. And some people prefer putting the title there, and that's fine as well. And then a bit of a description of the cohort and methods, and then the findings of the study, the conclusion and then the reference and attributions. So um, I'm quite a boring person, you know, when I when I do things, I like to keep things simple. So, you know, there's a lot of space for maneuvering um, of the layout of a visual abstract. But what I, when I make visual abstracts, I just keep things simple. So I tend to keep the dark gray areas constant. So in all my visual abstracts, these are all the same. So question, code and methods, conclusion and reference, these will be all the same. And I tend to make changes mostly on the finding section. So here are a few examples of different layouts I've used. So this is a very uh, standard layout where I just have the same classic layout that I've shown you. And then um, here's a visual abstract I made for Akiki 2. Um, so as you can say, question is the same core methods down the left side, conclusion and reference. And then what I did was um, I did a control arm versus intervention arm. And then I included just one important finding down the right hand side. And then here is a visual abstract I made for an article journal, uh, which was um, published in CJSON. So it's mainly just comparing the control and intervention arms. And here's one for DAPA CKD, where I made um, the outcomes down one side, and then vertically, instead of horizontally now, I've got the placebo versus um, intervention, and then a few key findings. 
And then um, this is another one where um, I made a visual abstract for an article um, with the main theme um, being the global state of conservative kidney management. And I just highlighted a few main ideas that the paper talked about as well. So you can see all these papers are fairly straightforward to make visual abstracts for. And sometimes there are papers which are a little bit more complicated to make um, a visual abstracts for, and then you have to kind of break the mold a little bit. So for example, um, I was asked to make a visual abstract for an article talking about the current state and future directions of the transplant nephrology workforce um, for ACKD. So this was um, a very text heavy uh, article. It was a, a very narrative article. So I thought, oh, it's quite hard to make um, a visual abstract without making it look like a wall of text. So what I tried to do was to have a story made out of it. So I thought I would, I would start off a story with of, of the primary nephron nephrologist um, in a phone call to a transplant nephrologist. That I thought oh, I'll put a boss here as well, just the transplant medical director, and then a few other important points down the side. And then um, here's another visual abstract that I made um, for the American Society of Transplantation on a case report. Um, again, it's a case report, so it's it's. Uh, it's a, a, quite a, a narrative as well. So I thought, oh, how can I make this more easy to understand? So I thought I'll make it like a timeline, you know, starting from pre-transplantation, um, talking about the donor and the recipient, and then what happened post-transplantation. So it kind of makes sense for the for the um, readers to just follow along the story. And then I'm quite proud of this one, um, which is when I made um, a visual abstract for an article on kidneys, uh, on the first um, kidney xenotransplant. So I thought I'd have a bit of fun, you know, by creating this mock-up of a patient file about the potential, uh, about the recipient, and a bit of a timeline, and then just uh, just a few other important points on the side here. You know, so it's, it's basically, it's up to you, you can do whatever you want, and it's just trying to find the fun in making a visual abstract. <laughs> so now we, we now we, I've told you, you know, how, how, um, how useful visual abstracts are, you know, but these are all anecdotal experience from my point of view. So let's look a bit at the evidence behind this. So I'm going to talk about um, quickly about this paper um, that I mentioned earlier on, um, written by Dr. Andre Ibrahim, the creator of visual abstracts. So I've, I've, I've kind of made a visual abstract for this paper as well. So this paper um, was a prospective case control crossover study um, based on 44 papers published between July and December 2016. And these papers um, were each tweeted twice from the Annals of Surgery Twitter account. So half the papers were tweeted only with the title, and then the other half were tweeted with the title and a visual abstract. So there was a four-week washout, and then the papers were then tweeted, but then the opposite way. So they were tweeted twice, once with the title and once with the title and visual abstract. So what they looked at was how the tweets did, comparing both the tweets with the title only and the tweets with the title and visual abstract. So it's quite clear, you know, the tweets with the visual abstracts got a lot more impressions. So more people saw it. There was a bigger spread. Um, there were a lot more retweets and there was also a lot more article visits as well. So this was this is quite clear, you know, that the tweets with visual abstracts um, do uh, get disseminated a lot more and do, do get engagement uh, engaged with a lot more. So this um, paper was written in 2017, so that was quite some time ago. Um, and since then, more studies have happened as well. So let's take a look at uh, more recent studies. So here we have two studies, so one written in 2019 and one written in 2020. So Linquist et al. wrote this paper um, in 2019, looking at geriatric research articles, and then they compared how tweets did without a visual abstract versus tweets with a visual abstract. So you can see only over four days, there were so many more impressions, so many, so many more um, retweets and a lot more likes already as well. So that only shows the power of attaching a, a visual abstract to a tweet. Um, and in 2020, um, Oscar et al., um, I think um, et al. includes, um, I think Dr. Lerma, and also um, Dr. Toff as well um, in this paper. So they looked at um, articles published in um, the American Journal of Nephrology, and they compared three kinds of tweets. So tweets with the citation only of the article, um, tweets with the key figure from the article, and tweets with visual, the visual abstract. So as you can see, clearly, you know, um, tweets with the visual abstract had a lot more impressions, had a higher, much higher engagement rate, had more retweets, and they looked to have a little bit more link clicks, but that was not um, really significant. <clears throat> so from this, you know, without a doubt, you know, if you had if you add a tweet, um, a visual abstract to your tweet, it goes further and more people see it. 
So some people decided to take this a bit further um, and, and um, in more recent times, um, last year, 2021, um, we have these two papers. So one paper from Agarwal et al. So this paper looked at um, tweet, uh, look at articles published between July 2018 and January 2019 um, in JAMA, BMJ and the New England Journal of Medicine. So tweets with visual abstracts in these articles, you know, there was no difference. Um, so they, they weren't cited anymore, you know, and people didn't really click into the page uh, in the full article anymore. And then Griffin et al. Um, wrote an article um, that was published in the British Journal of Urology looking at tweets with visual abstracts. So we know this, the tweets had more had more likes, more retweets, had more attention, but then again, were not associated with significantly more citations. So here's a summary, you know. So we do know it's very straightforward that tweets with visual abstracts, um, they do get disseminated more widely, more people see them, um, but then they do not necessarily translate into getting the articles um, cited more regularly, which I don't think is a surprise because if you think about it, if I'm taking a visual abstract um, to have the same impact as a text abstract, you know, I wouldn't judge the merit of an article based only on the visual abstract. So people still have to read the article and decide whether or not it's worth citing, you know, so I think it's very important to then temper the expectations you have for a visual abstract. So they're not magic, you know, they're very helpful, but they're not like super magic, okay. So that was then a part one. So we talked about the key components of a visual abstract, and we talked a bit about um, the, what evidence says around the utility of visual abstracts as well. So before we move on to the fun bit of the talk, um, there are two non-negotiables I want to harp on about for now. So as I said, you know, although there's a lot of room for um, flexibility, creativity, and um, a freedom um, to create whatever you want in a visual abstract, there are two things I think are non-negotiable. So the first thing is you have to provide a factual report of the key information in the study. So you cannot um, just uh, interpret the data however you want. You cannot bend it to suit your will. You have to report it as the authors have written it because it's not your information. You cannot play about with it, okay? And then the second one is you have to provide credit where credit is due. You cannot claim ownership for any elements that do not belong to you because these are going to be shared in the public domain and it's very important that you stick to copyright rules. Okay, now having talked about that, let's start talking about the cognitive load theory. So how did this come about? You know, so I gave a similar talk to this um, at the ASN Kidney Week about two years ago. And at that point in time, you know, I talked a lot about the practical tips on how to make um, a visual abstract more effective. You know, these, these were more things like well, how to choose the right colors, how to choose the right fonts, how to make sure that everything is aligned, you know. And since then, I've started studying a bit on medical education. And then I realized that there is a lot more to making an effective visual abstract than just making things look pretty, essentially. And when I learned about this cognitive load theory, it then helped me understand and then put into perspective um, the other un things that were hard to describe that made a good visual abstract a good visual abstract. So hopefully it'll help um, you as well. So the cognitive load theory, it was proposed in 1980s and essentially helped um, to inform uh, people on how to create good learning materials, essentially. Um, it involves explaining how meaningful learning works in the context of working memory, long-term memory, and schemas. So if you talk about working memory, so this is a memory that, that, that is very um, quickly accessed in our mind. Um, it can hold not more than five to nine items of um, information at a time, and it can only process about two to four blocks of information simultaneously. So it's, 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 it's quite a small working space, and, it, and the, mem um, the memory only lasts for a few seconds, and most of the information is gone by 20 seconds if you don't rehearse it. But it's a working space where you hold working parts of a knowledge or knowledge that is new to you. And then we have long-term memory. So this I think about as a vault, um, as, a as a storage system for all the information you will ever know or you have or you know. So these information um, are organized into these um, things called schemas or frameworks. So for example, when I say, okay, think about the causes of hyperkalemia, then you might have a framework that pops up telling you how to approach hyperkalemia or how, how, how would you approach AKIs that a, fr a framework might pop up. So basically when you learn, you're transferring a new knowledge from your working memory and you're trying to incorporate that into schemas that you already know in your long-term memory. So that is how learning takes place. So visual abstracts, you know, they're they are quite small snippets of learning material. And I think that it's very helpful you know, and, and there are a lot of ways to optimize this learning material to help readers and learners get as much information as they can from the visual abstracts. And of course, you know, the following things that we're going to talk about um, does not only apply to 
creating visual abstracts. It also applies to when you're thinking about creating like talks and lectures and other learning material as well. So hopefully you'll find it useful. So there are three types of cognitive load that we're thinking about. So the first type is the intrinsic cognitive load. So this is the cognitive load that your brain has to deal with when it comes to terms with the raw material or the knowledge that has to be learned. So everybody has a different um, level of experience and expertise in certain fields. So what might be difficult to you might not be difficult to other people and vice versa, but this is the intrinsic cognitive load. And then you have the germane cognitive load, which is the work that your brain has to do to try to kind of make sense of the information that is presented to you and how you how you process that information so that it can be incorporated into your uh, long term memory. And then you have the extraneous cognitive load. So this is a cognitive load that basically comes from the learning material itself and the presentation of it. It's things that distract you from learning. So for example, if you're trying to read a textbook in a very noisy coffee shop, that distraction gives you extraneous cognitive load. Or if you're trying to see a, a visual abstract and it's very busy, there's too much text, you can't even read the writing, you know. So then that detracts from the experience of learning. But then if you can have all these um, cognitive load in the right balance, then you'll be able to achieve meaningful learning. So before I go ahead, um, is is that clear? Is that any are there any questions about the cognitive load? <coughs> okay. So um, so what does this mean in the context of um, visual abstracts? So in terms of intrinsic cognitive load, um, here's an explanation. So it's, it, it relates to the content and the subject matter of the paper. So unless you write the paper um, or decide which subject matter is in the paper, this is out of your control. So you can't do much to change it. And for the germane cognitive load is how you present the information to help the reader um, absorb it or understand it a bit easier. So you can change a bit of, these, of this, um, but at the same time, you also can't change the level of understanding of your reader easily. So it's not totally in your control. Whereas the extraneous cognitive load, um, it, it is involved um, with like not wasting your reader's energy on factors irrelevant to learning. So because you're making the visual abstract and you are definitely in control of this. So this is something that you should be working to try to decrease. So. So here are a few questions I think about when I'm dealing with the cognitive loads um, when making visual abstracts. So for intrinsic cognitive load, is this a suitable paper? Um, and we'll go into this in a bit more detail. And how much information should I include? Because the more information you include, the more complex and more difficult it is to understand. And then um, for germane cognitive load, you could ask yourself, am I providing um, sufficient context for the visual abstract? And then for extraneous cognitive load, you know, how can I help the reader focus on information that you're presenting in the visual abstract? Now, in terms of managing intrinsic cognitive load, so is this a suitable paper? So as you can see from my previous examples, there are some papers um, that are easier to make visual abstracts for than other papers. So suitable papers are papers who uh, who clearly like compare two interventions. There's a very good paper for a visual abstract. Um, papers who talk about, say, the 25 genetic mutations that were discovered that causes condition X, you know, then the results are essentially listing out the, the genetic mutations. So things like that are not really um, suitable for visual abstracts. I mean, you can make a visual abstract. Um, I can, I've certainly only turned down one paper for a visual abstract ever in my career, but it won't be that great a visual abstract. It won't be that impactful. Um, and so and, and another question is of how much information should I include? So when I teach people, I tend to recommend that um, you include at least all the information in the text abstract, because that is information that the authors have deemed to be the most important. So by the time you include all that information, you really won't have much space left. You know, but if you do for by some miracle, then you can try to include include um, other bits of information from the paper. But I would say just aim to include all the information on the abstract as a minimum. And then in terms of um, optimizing the germane load, so it's whether or not you're providing sufficient context to the paper. So things that can help with this are like, you know, if you use a question as the title of the paper, then if you ask a question that the, that the study is trying to answer, when people read the question, they kind of kind of know what you're going to show in the visual abstract already. And then they kind of, kind of adjust their mindset as to um, starting to accept what the visual abstract says. And then if you include the methods and cohorts as well, um, that will give you a more uh, well-rounded perspective on what the study of population is. And if you include the conclusion of the study, then that will definitely tell you that the that will tell you definitely what the conclusion the authors are presenting, as opposed to you having to second guess whether or not you've understood the visual abstract enough. 
and um, finally decreasing extraneous cognitive load. So this is um, where I tend to have uh, where I tend to focus on when I teach people how to make visual abstracts. You know, it's things like making sure the flow of information is clear so that you're signposting readers where to go so that they read the information in sequence, um, choosing the right typefaces and fonts so that your visual abstract is legible um, and not distracting to read. Um, the same goes for a color palette, you know, choosing a harmonious, um, a, a low key, um, minimalist color palette instead of like trying to distract people with bright colors and flashes everywhere. Um, and balancing text on icons. So before, a long time ago, I used to think that the more icons, the better. Um, but then I just realized that you just make your visual abstract look really busy and um, it's just, you then lose a lot of space for text. So now I tend to recommend that you use one icon per main point, and that seems to be the right balance. And then, um, uh, self-explanatory if you if everything is lined up properly and neatly then that makes your visual abstract a bit more attractive and a bit easier to read as well so while i'm here um, i think it's important to talk about accessibility so this is something that um, unfortunately isn't prioritized a lot because you know we're not trained we, we don't have any formal training in design and, and therefore we don't um, tend to uh, realize this a lot but it's important that you make sure that your visual abstract is accessible to as many people as possible so here are a few pointers as well so making sure that you have um, a good contrast between your foreground and background elements so that it's easy to read. And then things like colors. So here I've got four different color palettes and the color palette um, on the leftmost is how these colors would look like um, to people who don't have color vision deficiency. And the rest of the three color palettes are the same colors in the leftmost palette, but then based on how people with color vision deficiency look like, look at. So the thing is that, you know, some colors might look very different to you, but then you don't know if other people process colors differently and they might look very similar to people. So if you're only using colors to differentiate your elements in your visual abstract, just be aware that you have to make sure that they are definitely different enough so that people can tell the difference properly. So linking into that, um, I would also go further to advise, you know, don't rely on colors or icons alone. So for example, in this box on the left here, you know, I said, you know, this, this thing is in your control and you can decrease it. And because you can do something about it, I put it in green because green means go do something about it. But besides putting the thing in green, I've also put a check mark as well to just double, to just double um, hammer the point home saying that this is something you can do something about. And then for this here, um, you have like a, a pair of kidneys with some lightning bolts. So I put there acute kidney injury because it might be very self-explanatory to me because I made the visual abstract. But then to somebody else, say, say to a urologist, it might mean um, colic, renal colic from stones, you know. So you don't know who is going to read your visual abstract. Therefore, it's very, therefore it's very important um, that you also label your icons wherever possible as well. And then and the next thing is to make sure that you try to highlight the more important points in your visual abstract, because not everything in your visual abstract is going to be as important as, as each other. So it's finding a way to just differentiate the important headings from the less important subheadings and subtitles. And this next point <coughs> is fairly <clears throat> self-explanatory. So there are certain fonts um, that are easy to read, like on the left, like these ones. And then there are certain fonts that are clearly um, hard to read and quite decorative. So you want to shy away from these hard to read fonts and then use more of um, the ones that are easier to read. And lastly, um, whenever you're posting somebody uh, um, a visual abstract, for example, on Twitter, um, there's also an option to um, attach an alternate text onto your picture as well for people who are vision impaired. So for example, you can use this text like, this is a visual abstract of the X study. Please read the paper for more details. So for if for whatever reason, if nobody can see the, the visual abstract or if it's in load or if, 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 if there's a problem with it showing up, that at least people will know that what this um, picture was showing and it will also point them towards the study as well okay so just because um i, I really I, th I think it's really important just the non-negotiables again and then what will happen next um is i will just do a, a quick demonstration of how i make a visual abstract so there's a qr code at the bottom of the screen so this will give you a copy of the abstract that is shown on the top because I'm going to move away from the screen in a bit. So if you want to um, scan that QR code and get that on your screen, and then I can give you um, a bit of time to just quickly read through it. So um, this is a study um, showing the positive association between intraoperative fluid balance and postoperative acute kidney injury in non-cardiac surgery. And I've color coded um, bits of the abstract in different colors. So the green highlighter um, shows me um, the methods and cohorts of the study. 
Uh, the blue is information relating to intraoperative fluid balance. And then the orange is related to the postoperative AKI and, and the results of the study as well. So what happens when I get a, an assignment to do a visual abstract is that I read the article and then I read the abstract and then I highlight um, the important bits of the abstract and then just color, color code them so that I know that, um, that they belong to different categories of information. And then what I do as well is I then lay it out. So as I said, I'm a very boring person, you know, so the top and left and bottom is always the same for me. And I just play about with the findings portion. So for this paper, I thought that the two key um, ideas I wanted to talk about was the intraoperative fluid balance and its link, <laughs> literally a link, um, with acute kidney injury. So I've chosen to put that right down in the middle of the results um, results section. And then um, in terms of the intraoperative fluid balance, I wanted to write about the, defini the definition of the fluid balance and then the risk factors. And then for AKIs, the rate of post-op AKIs and the finding, which is the higher um, intraoperative fluid balance, is associated with a post-op AKI. So I was given a template by this article, uh, by this journal anyway. Um, so this is the template. So what I did was I just put on the question at the top, then I just copied and pasted the conclusion and then the attributions here. And then down the left is my usual methods and cohort. So it was a retrospective cohort study of a single center um, in, about in 5,168 patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery um, from 2007 to 2011. Then as before, um, this is a bit about the intraoperative fluid balance. So I went quite literally with a balance scale. And then I wanted to put the definition of the fluid balance and the risk factors. And then, so the definition was this based on the abstract. And then these were also stated in the abstract as well. That I changed them into graphics. So I thought I was being clever back then. Um, but looking at it now, I think this is quite difficult to understand because, you know, I thought oh, ins minus outs divided by body weight. But if I had to redo it just now, I would probably simplify this net fluid balance um, icons, so maybe just put text instead. And then because, um, uh, the CRP and um, serum albumin are blood tests, so this, these are blood tubes and then proteinuria with a urine dipstick. And then for the second half, um, there's acute kidney injury, as I stated before, and then the rate of post-op AKI was 309, and then um, the higher um, IFB was associated with post-op AKI, and that's the odds ratio. So then that is how I just translated into that. And then you just put the both together, and there you have it. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I have got um, a, a more detailed video as well, which you can scan here, but this is also part of the Duke's um, visual abstract course. So it, this will all be um, included in the QR code at the very end, so you don't have to scan this one if you don't want to, that's totally fine. So now you've made your visual abstract, you know, and you think, oh, that's the worst part over, that's the hardest part over. <laughs> no, um, because this is the most important part probably and the hardest part. Um, so. A few, a few um, important points, you know, so not all feedback is equal. So I think it's important that you share your visual abstract with a trusted few people to get their um, perspective. But it's also important to be aware that not everybody has experience in making visual abstracts. So uh, some people can maybe would give you higher um, level feedback, but then most people should be able to give you um, general feedback on whether or not your visual abstract is easy to understand, whether or not it's legible or whether or not it's easy to read. And of course, it's helpful to enlist multiple sources so you get um, a few different perspectives. And what I found really helpful as well is to ask a non-expert because um, if you just ask people who have the same expertise in your field, then they tend to probably understand things a bit better. Whereas if you ask somebody who is less, less of an expert, then they might be able to like, point you towards blind spots that you didn't realize before um, about how, to, how you can make your visual abstract more easy to understand. And I cannot stress this enough, you know, if you're serious about it, you need to be prepared to work through multiple iterations. Like before, um, I'm not sure if Swap remembers, like when, when I started making visual abstracts, you know, I used to share my visual abstracts um, to like to, to all the people, to the faculty um, in the social media collective. And literally, it took me, it would take me at least uh, six to seven versions before it was fit for publication, you know. So the things like, you know, this will happen. And if you truly want to improve, this is the way you, there, there's no shortcut, you know. But I do appreciate that not everybody has the capacity or the time or nor the desire to go through all of this and that's totally fair enough um, and that's why you know some journals um they have um, visual abstract teams who can do this for you and take this off your plate now you've gone through all of this and you've now got a visual abstract that's ready to share with the world so here are a few tips to just think about before you share it 
So it's important that you're able to check um, how your visual abstract looks on different screens. So the thing is that, you know, at home, I've got this 27 inch screen in front of me. I've got a 24 inch screen next to me. They're very big and nice screens. So whenever I make visual abstracts, everything looks really big and really nice. But I have to remember that most of the people looking at my visual abstracts will be looking at them on the phone. You know, so it's important to make sure that you know that your visual abstract can be seen properly when you're looking on the phone as well. And then um, are the necessary attributions in place? Have you credited um, the journal, the institution, the authors, yourself, because you made the visual abstract? Um, any icons which you have um, not bought or any fonts, you know, these are all things that you have to attribute. And then as a last tip, um, save your visual abstract as a PNG file. So you can save it as a JPEG, but then if you realize, if you forget to save it as the best quality, the JPEG um, system will compress your files and make them look a bit grainy. Whereas if you save it as PNGs, um, the sharpness will be maintained throughout. So after all of that, then feel free to share um, your visual abstract. So there is no limit, you know, to where you want to, to where you can share your visual abstract. Wherever you can share pictures, you can share your visual abstract, you know, Twitter, Mastodon, Instagram, um, any blogs, uh, Facebook, you know, anywhere you can share a picture. And then you can drive engagement by, say, for example, you can ask um, a question relating to the study and ask people what they think. Then you can include the visual abstract and then link to the paper and then share it. Then people will tend to respond with what, what their opinions are. Um, you can also like tag certain people, um, like special interest groups, like for example, NFJC, um, or your, your institution, the authors, to just drive more, um, more of the conversation. You can also use hashtags as well to just get more people to have a look at your tweet and your visual abstract. Okay, so that is part two finished. Okay, so now the last part um, and a um, very quick part is about limitations of visual abstracts. So we know that you know, visual abstracts are great, but they're not um, the magic bullet. They're not, they're not super magic, but there are a few limitations um, relating to visual abstracts. So um, there is not yet um, a gold standard of what a visual abstract should be or how a visual abstract should look like. Therefore, um, unfortunately, there's a very wide variety, um, a very <laughs> a wide variation of the standard of visual abstracts. So in a way, I'm happy that um, the visual abstracts produced by Neff Twitter are usually produced by the same few culprits. And then we all learn from the same place. You know, we all we all have a, we are all on the same page. So usually um, the visual abstracts produced by the nephrology community are pretty much standardized in a way. Um, some journals, when they have visual abstract teams and things like um, uh, journals like CJSON, uh, like KI Reports, Kidney Medicine, uh, I think Jason as well, they've got um, their own visual, um, Kidney360, um, they have their own um, visual abstract teams and they have some sort of internal um, quality control within those teams, but otherwise there's still a lack of a gold standard of how visual abstracts should look. Now the other thing that is a bit unfortunate is that there, is, uh, there isn't a, a official repository of visual abstracts, you know, therefore you have a, a visual abstracts floating about in different spaces online um, and there is bound to be a few different versions of a visual abstract for a single paper. So that ties into selection bias because visual abstracts are fairly new, you know, so they've only been here for the past five to six years. Um, therefore, the papers that will get the visual abstracts are the ones that are the newer papers, the ones that are, that are bigger papers, um, and the ones that are controversial or the ones that are the, the really um, uh, breaking trials. So the things like, you know, papers that are maybe a few decades old or papers of our older studies or smaller studies or less famous studies um, won't have, uh, are less likely to have a visual abstract associated with them. Therefore, you get this um, selection bias at play where like the bigger studies tend to get disseminated even more and then the smaller studies don't get that advantage. And then um, another big one is um, accessibility and inclusivity. So um, admittedly, my Twitter is in English, you know, so and I think most of the visual abstracts I see are made in English. There are a few of my collaborators who are making visual abstracts in Spanish. Um, so that is that is up and coming. And <coughs> I'm pretty sure that <coughs> As the movement grows, um, there will be more and more people around the world who will pick up making visual abstracts and hopefully there'll be more and more visual abstracts in different languages coming up. Um, and in terms of inclusivity, you know, not everybody has access to internet, the internet. So sometimes um, people who are not able to access the internet might be a bit of a disadvantage by not being able to access visual abstracts like we are able to. 
So that's brief. That's essentially it. So just just a quick recap of my um, learning objectives. So hopefully you're able to down describe the key components of a visual abstract, and then um, you have a bit of a more of awareness about what the evidence says about the utility of visual abstracts. And then um, just a very quick whistle stop tour through cognitive load theory and how that can help you create better learning materials and visual abstracts. And then finally, we talked about about the limitations of visual abstracts. So the last step is up to you. You know, so hopefully um, you will now feel more inspired to create your own visual abstracts. And then there's um, a QR code again for the uh, Duke visual abstract course. And then um, last but not least, just some acknowledgements to people who have helped me along my way, you know, and without the help um, and support from all these people, I will never be here. Um, and also a great thank you to the Nephrology Social Media Collective as well. Um, here's my Twitter account if you want to follow me. You don't have to, honestly, no obligation. Um, and you can email me as well if you want to, if any questions or if there's anything else I can help with. Um, but thank you for having me again. Um, really appreciate your invite. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That was a wonderful overview of the of the topic. Um, so if people have questions, and I hope they do, uh, please uh, raise your hand and I'll, I'll call <coughs> up uh, as time goes. Um, but I'll, I'll start the ball rolling with the, uh, some questions. I really love the way you know you you showed the cognitive load theory and, and all that. And, and there are educators in the audience who I'm sure will have some questions. But I'll, I'll again I'll start the ball rolling. Uh, this is a conversation we have had on Twitter as well. Uh, so I, you know where I'm heading to. Um, the uh, I like the non-negotiables uh, aspect, especially in uh, in particular. But the the uh, concern that people often have, which you alluded to, is that you know. The visual abstract is not the complete story. You have to read the paper, um, and and um, you say that whatever is there in the abstract, that information should be there in the visual abstract. Now, each journal has their own style for text abstracts. Uh, you know, some journals like Annals will insist on limitations uh, of the paper to be there in the abstract, but many other journals don't. Uh, and that's my concern: is that you know sometimes the limitations of the paper get brushed off. Now, how do you how do you needle the thread there? You know, how do you thread the needle there about, you know, you you don't want to edit editorialize, but at the same time, sometimes there may be big limitations or adverse effects of a drug that don't make it to the text abstract. But you know, as a communicator, uh, you think they are important to be included. How would you you know go about that process? Um, you know, we talked about canvas where you know the amputations were not mentioned, but I think amputations are usually important so, so you know, we did include we, we made an editorial subjective decision to include them uh, how, how does that process go uh, and what do you think about that yeah i think it's difficult i think um it's probably uh, you could probably have more leeway on controlling this when you're making a visual abstract for your own personal use because I think that yeah, you, know, you think about visual abstracts in two different ways. So you you might either be commissioned to make a visual abstract for the journal itself, mm -hmm. or you can be um, making a visual abstract for general use, like say general class or teaching. So I think you probably have a bit more leeway if you're making um, visual abstracts for personal use because you can essentially control what you want to include in the visual abstract. And I appreciate it. Yes, things like adverse effects, um, especially major ones, are important to include if you can. But I think sometimes. Um, it comes at the expense of other information. So I think it depends on what your intention is to, when you set out to make a visual abstract. For example, you want to highlight um, how well uh, uh, intervention works against versus placebo, or you want to highlight the adverse reactions that you might get with the intervention. So I think it's, it's, it's impossible to include everything, but sometimes depending on the context of your use, you might want to adjust what you include in the visual abstract, if that makes sense. However, um, it becomes a bit more difficult when you're creating a visual abstract for a journal or when you're commissioned to do something because you can you can make a visual abstract based on how you want to um, portray the information, but then you might get pushback from the authors and or the editorial um, department of the journal itself. That in that case, then what tends to happen is that there'll be a to and fro between the creator, the author, and the editor as well. And then there'll be plenty of discussion and then eventually we will come to what we hope is a compromise. And then that is then that will then represent the journal essentially. So it's it's very different when you're doing different visual abstracts with different people. Yeah, absolutely. And and like you said, nothing uh, you know nothing uh, uh, is as important as reading the full text. This is yeah, just definitely. Oh, yeah, this is just a window into uh, going there. Um, uh, Dr. Karpinski. Yeah, actually, it's got a little bit related to that, right? Um, so. You know, it's very interesting because it is a work of scholarship in terms of, you know, your creativity and your um, 
your communication skills through the medium of visual abstract, uh, but it's also someone else's scholarship in terms yes. of their primary research. So I guess I was wondering uh, a couple of things. You know, one is um, what sort of uh, interactions or feedback um, or uh, have you had from authors um, whose work you have, you know, thus thus translated uh, for, for hopefully a larger audience for them? Um, and the second is, you know, how do you represent this as your own scholarship uh, in terms of your own, you know, academic career and um, uh, and and you know, yeah, academic path? Yeah. So, um, in terms of the kinds of feedback I receive, so it, it ranges a lot. So I suppose um, that depends on how, uh, what experience the authors have had with visual abstracts, um, because it's still a fairly new movement. Some people don't, um, they try to add in a lot of other information, like they try to add in as much information as they can, which I can understand why, you know, but the thing is like, sometimes there isn't, we are not able to do that because then that will just make the visual abstract very hard to follow. So the things um, that I've been asked to do are like to, to add in certain graphs. Um, you know, I, I always try to accommodate any requests that I get, you know, and usually I'm able to accommodate uh, requests, um, all requests. But then sometimes it's hard to explain that, you know, this is a visual abstract. It's not actually a, a proper summary of the paper. Therefore, you know, it might be counterproductive to add on all this information that you require. So, but then usually after discussion, they will we'll come to an agreement usually. But but the 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 requests can range from like different colors for stuff, different fonts, and um, for things to look a different way for different icons. Um, but the most commonly um, thing I have requested is by um to add more information. Mm. And I think um once we try to show them that you know if you add in a lot of information, this is how it will look like. You'll look very cluttered. You won't be able to read it. Then people tend to understand and tend to um accept that they can add on more information. Um, now, in terms of um, how I interpret um, creating visual abstracts as my academic path, so um, it's a bit difficult. So I, I tend to like list. Um, I have a, I have a portfolio of all the visual abstracts that I have made. You know, I think it's difficult to present it as original academic work because it really isn't. Um, I'm just translating um, somebody else's work into a more digestible form, a different format. So um, I don't really count this as academic work per se. It's just like creating. Um, educational material more than anything that makes sense I hear you but but it's more than that it is your I mean through your work their work is reaching a larger audience it's a form of it's a form of communication it's a form of teaching without your additional skills that would not occur um, so I was just wondering that if your academic institution recognizes that within a you know promotion pathway in 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 in, in because it's very challenging to, you know, uh, have traditional um, promotion pathways and look at some of these non-traditional ways of um, essentially dissemination um, yeah. of, uh, of work, right? Which was one of the one of the types of scholarship. Yeah, I think it's a bit difficult here and in, in where I am just now as well, because I think it's just so new that not a lot of people know about it yet. So yeah. I think as it grows here and people more more, more people tend to uh, learn about it, I think then that it will, people will start taking it a bit more seriously in a way, you know. So I think um I think a lot more work needs to be done to just um just share how good and how useful visual abstract can be, you know. Um so I think that will take time, but hopefully that will happen in time. Yeah, and I guess the kind of scholarship, you know, like for example the the studies you mentioned, uh, you know, academia likes. A study so maybe you know you'll need a study about you'll need to make a study about the visual abstract movement <laughs> to convince uh, uh convince academia or, or you know again presentations of course help um uh, there but but i hear you you know but you can be a trailblazer uh, as as uh, uh, as you have been uh, by making by you know creating a path in academia uh, i'll ask some mundane questions that i'm sure you've heard before but i'm i'm sure the others have uh, some of the audience have in their head is that and you talked about icons for example um uh, how how do you get these icons do you make them or or are there easier sources uh, for someone who's starting off are there again you know i'm sure your duke, duke uh, course has a lot of these tips but are there some high level uh, tips you can give about you know making color choices uh, or uh, icons <coughs> yeah so um icons so uh depends on those with color or without color so my color my icons without colors all come from the noun project so um there are free icons available but not a lot of them are specialized and it's hard to find icons of like kidneys and dialysis and blood vessels which are free 
So if you use free icons, you have to attribute the source of the icons. Whereas if you pay towards subscription of some icon libraries, then you can use them without um, attributions. So the source I use for my non-color icons, so the color, the icons I use for CJSON, all come from this um, website called the Noun Project. So it's quite affordable and it's a student discount, uh, an academic discount as well. And all my colored icons um, come from this place called Flat Icon, which is a bit more expensive because they're all colored icons, um, but it's also a paid subscription as well. Um, so, so there are a lot of icon libraries, but these are the two I have to just like and then in terms of um colors yeah. and stuff like that um so i think uh that it's very important to make sure that when you depict people uh, or subject um or, or patients that you don't only depict um a homogeneous population that you make sure that it to be as inclusive and that as diverse as possible excellent points um i think there's a hand up from peter magna Hi, um, I'm interested in the impact of these uh, and the examples you used that measured impact were all Twitter based. So what about yeah. those that large chunk of physicians and scientists who don't use Twitter? Not to diss Swapnil and all those acolytes, but not everybody is a twit. <laughs> <coughs> no, fair enough. Um, so um, I think it's easier to measure uh, the stats on Twitter because you can get engagement rates and you can get all the numbers from Twitter. I think um, because this movement is still so new, there are still studies um, studies studying its impact on, um, say, things like conferences or things like teaching sessions. So I think I've not seen a lot of these coming up just yet, but definitely um, there, there, there will be more coming up. I think it's just easier to get data from Twitter because everything is like the views and the impressions and engagements are all recorded there already. So you can just pull the data. So I think that's the initial step, but definitely I think there will be more coming. <laughs> Yeah, and and uh, to add on to that, a bunch of journals are actually adding on. Like CJSON um, puts in the visual abstract in the article itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you, if you read an article, the first figure is the visual abstract, which is kind of nice. Uh, is that it's just not shared on social media. It's kind of a part of the article. Uh, even uh, even New England puts it on their website as well, and and BMJ as well. So I, I mean, these journals are doing it because. Again, I, I'm I'm saying this because there is lack of evidence, but uh, these journals are doing it because they probably know uh, that uh, that these things uh, do work in terms of uh, getting you know something the eyeballs out there. And and again, these studies have to be interpreted cautiously because you know, for example, for New England, uh, the page views, download, citations are so high uh, that to add on the effect of visual abstract on a very high baseline will be very difficult to show compared to you know a journal like kidney medicine or kidney 360 mm -hmm. which is just starting off where you may be able to demonstrate a huge increase in in downloads and page views mm -hmm. um you know again but that's me uh, uh, arguing because i i, I am pro visual aspect. Like <laughs> <laughs> um so if if there are uh, no other questions i think we can wrap it up uh, here this was a fantastic session thanks for uh, presenting us despite you know being under the weather uh, Michelle uh, and I'm uh, I'm really uh, excited for what uh, the future has to hold for uh, for visual abstracts thank and the you. whole field of digital communication. Um, thank you. Well, thank you very much again. Thank you for the invite. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>